tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I'll start by setting an unfortunately common scene for you, one that I wish happened less often, but one I'm sure nearly all of you will totally understand. You're out for a lovely meal with friends and family, enjoying jokes, sharing stories, debating politics, and you chow down to a really nice meal of food. You go home, you hop into bed, you're tired, you're satisfied, you fall asleep, and you wake up in the middle of the night with violent stomach pains. You have terrible gastroenteritis for two days, and you just feel absolutely wrung out. Unfortunately, this is something that happens more common than many of you might think. It can be violent, it can be mild, it can be short-lived, or it can last a lifetime. And in some extreme cases, it can even take a life. So it's, it's pretty serious stuff, foodborne illness. Food that is safe, wholesome, nutritious, is the fundament of life. And it's something that many of us take for granted, but we probably shouldn't. Um, we probably should think about it a little more carefully. I should say that in New Zealand and developed countries, we've got great food safety systems in place and lots of controls developed to, to protect the consumer against these types of episodes. But to contextualise the scale of the problem, in 2010, the World Health Organisation estimated that some 600 million people got illness, foodborne illness that year and around 420,000 people lost their lives from contaminated food. So this is a, a pretty big deal. Climate change and rapid population growth are arguably the two most significant threats to food safety globally at the moment. Climate change is impacting our environment from floods to the spread of pests and diseases and population increases placing increased pressure on our food production supply and um, also our food safety and quality systems. We're really good at, redu at, at reducing illness by treating food, by putting in place controls, but what we're not so good at is actually preventing the contamination from occurring in the first place. I believe that we need to address these global challenges, climate change, population growth, and that food safety risk will diminish accordingly. It won't go away altogether, but we could make it less impactful. We need a more holistic approach. So look, we know a lot about what causes foodborne illness, and I'd kind of like to bring you into my world for a few minutes to unpack what the causative agents of foodborne illness are. And these have been studied by scientists all over the world for, for a long, long time. So we do have a really good handle on the beasties, on the nasties, on the baddies that are in food. This is a, a picture of a variety of algae that naturally occur in the sea. So they produce natural toxins that seafood can sometimes accumulate. And when you eat the seafood, you can become really ill. We have natural toxins produced by plants that we eat too. There are a variety of chemical risks that can arise in the food supply chain too. Those, those can stem from the use of pesticides and herbicides with traces carried over onto the food. They can come from recycled packaging material that transfers residues onto your food. We can even get tiny little bits of plastic that come from synthesised materials that have broken down on your food. Chemicals can cause chronic effects right now. You can get really crook right now or they can have an accumulative effect over your entire life and you can become chronically ill later in your life. So these are really serious issues. There are also viruses that are foodborne, so norovirus and hepatitis A are a few of those. These are particularly hardy and stable on food and they can last a long time. They can cause gastroenteritis and on the other hand, they can cause very serious liver disease. <coughs> There are also bacteria, and this is a particular concern for the food industry, who are very vigilant around controlling bacterial growth. So there's Salmonella, there's Listeria, there's E. coli, there's Campylobacter and others. What can happen is the bacteria can grow on your food, and if they reach high enough numbers, they can cause you to be sick in a mild way or sick in a very serious way. The food industry has, as I've said, developed very good controls. They do take this very seriously and they understand very well that poisoning your customers is not a great business model. So rest assured that most of the food that you'll be presented with in the supermarket is good to eat. To give you an idea about some of these controls, this will be uh, um, an example that you'll be familiar with. It's the pasteurisation of milk. It was invented by a great scientist called Louis Pasteur and it involves heating every particle of milk for a set time at a set temperature to kill the bacteria and make it safe to, to drink. 
And so there's examples for all different food types around these sorts of controls that we apply to make sure it is safe for you to eat. But it does make me think, you know, are we actually dealing with the root cause of the problem and are we preventing contamination from occurring in the first place? And the other issue, I guess, with control strategies is that we might be inadvertently causing unintended consequences. And I'll give you an example of that. Some of you might have heard about AMR or antimicrobial resistance. There are strains of bacteria, fungi, parasites and viruses that are resistant to the controls that we apply to them. So they're resistant to heat, they're resistant to chlorination, they're resistant to the use of antibiotics, for example. Why do they do that? Because they're just like us, they want to survive. So they alter their genomes so that they can survive those treatments. This is a really big deal because now we have drug-resistant illnesses that are on the rise and a lot more people are getting sick globally from these superbugs. So you'll hear a lot more about this as time goes on. Don't get me wrong, we do need to keep treating our food per current practices, but I'm just saying we need to shift our focus a little bit and start to think about how we can prevent these things happening in the first place. So where do we start? Let's start with climate change. <clears throat> so climate change is definitely happening and it's probably the biggest challenge we've ever faced. The International Planet on Climate Change estimated that in the 20th century, the Earth's temperature rised on average by 0.6 degrees Celsius. That's more than the previous nine centuries prior. And it also estimates that we're going to see a temperature rise of between 0.3 and 5 degrees Celsius by 2110, a very significant hike. So what are we seeing here in Aotearoa, New Zealand? I live at the top of the South Island, not far from two beautiful glaciers down the west coast, and it's undeniable that our glaciers are melting. We're having heavy rainfalls and storms here. There's been several in the last few months. We have an increase in rainfall in some areas, and on the other hand, we have increased drought and water scarcity in other areas. So our climate is shifting underneath our feet. Arguably, these changes are impacting the safety of our foods. Heavy rain and flooding can contaminate water sources that are important for the irrigation of our crops, they're important for washing our food, and we need to drink. So if they become contaminated, this is a really big problem. An example of this is a town in New Zealand called Havelock North. In that town in 2016, 5,500 people of the town's 14,000 residents contracted Campylobacteriosis, which is a really nasty stomach bug. 45 people ended up in hospital, and three of those people probably died as a consequence of this event. So how did it happen? there was a very heavy rainfall event and faeces from sheep in a paddock adjacent to the town's water supply washed into the water supply, taking Campylobacter, the bacteria, with it and people then drank it. This type of problem is occurring more frequently around the world. Another issue with climate change is the proliferation, the spread of pests and diseases and I'll, I'll give you a tangible example of this. This is a marine bacteria, a bacteria that lives in the sea. It's called Vibrio parahemolyticus. And Vibrio parahemolyticus can accumulate in seafood and if you eat enough of it, you can get gut sake from it. So it's a particularly nasty uh, bacteria. This bacteria likes warm water. So as our waters warm, we're seeing more Vibrio parahemolyticus issues occur worldwide. Some researchers have linked climate change and our warming oceans with an increase in illness from Vibrio parahemolyticus. And consistent with this, in New Zealand in the last three years, we have seen illness from seafood consumers with this particular bacteria, whereas prior to that, we saw very little or none. Another issue with climate change is the increase of emerging infectious diseases or EID. Emerging infectious diseases are diseases that can be transmitted between animals or from animals to humans or from human to human. And they're transmitted either directly from me to you or through an object or through food. I read a paper in Nature recently and the paper um, purports that these are on the rise. 
So I'd like you to just take a moment and think about the diseases, the big pandemics and epidemics that have occurred in your lifetime. I can remember SARS coronavirus in 2003. I can remember MERS coronavirus in 2012. And I can remember Ebola in Western Africa between 2013 and 2016. I can remember Zika virus in 2015. And we all know about COVID, it's on us right now. So these things are on the rise, and some scientists believe that that's linked to climate. Five in less than 20 years, it's, it's a really big deal. So fueled by climate change, but also by population growth. Obviously, if we have more people, it's possible for these things to transmit more widely. And we're very mobile now, so we can travel anywhere in the world within two days. We can take the disease we have now, and we can take it to a naive population and pass this on. So I can sort of feel you asking me, but what does this have to do with food and food safety? I'd like you to think about COVID for a minute. And what we know about COVID is that it's a respiratory virus largely transmitted in aerosols. Um, if I sneeze and I've got it, then you breathe it in, it goes into your respiratory tract where it multiplies and you get infected. With COVID, we know that if SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID, lands on food and you eat that, scientists believe that that's then inactivated by the gastric juices in your stomach. So COVID isn't foodborne, but just take a couple of seconds to think about what if COVID had been foodborne. It would have been much more serious than the current issue we've got. Now, most infectious diseases aren't foodborne, but a small subset are, and we do have examples of those that have occurred here that we've been very fortunate to stamp out very quickly. It's something we need to be mindful of as our population increases. Scientists need to get in place very good surveillance and monitoring programs for EID, um, and, and we really need to be vigilant. If we detect them early, we can stamp them out. So focusing on population growth for another minute, it's another big looming issue. The Food and Agricultural Organisation of the United Nations has estimated that we're going to need another 70% of food production in order to feed the 9.1 billion people by 2050. Another 70% food. That's a huge amount, so how are we going to achieve that? I, I can't unpack that fully for you, but what I would like to say is that at the moment, we waste one third of all food produced globally, one third. It's an absolute shocker. That equates to about 1.3 billion tonnes of food per year that is just going into landfill. We've got to do better. So if we could reduce that amount we're wasting, it will go a long way to feeding those additional souls. Another issue with population growth that relates to food safety is the water supply. Now I've talked about climate change, I've talked about drought, I've talked about water scarcity, and I've talked about increasing contamination of water. So you imagine if we've got more people, we've really got a lot of pressure there. We need to have more water for those people to drink. We're going to have to reuse water more than we do now. We're probably going to have to reuse our wastewater. We're going to need to develop techniques to do that, better techniques than we have now. And we're going to have to get better at saving the water supplies that we currently have. So I believe that climate change is fueling the contamination of, of foods and it is exacerbated by population increase. We have good tools in place now to keep food safe and we should keep those, but we also just need to turn our focus a little and start thinking about how we prevent this from happening. And we really need to address our changing planet and climate change specifically. Prevention's better than cure, so let's start working on prevention. A major part of this lies with, with government, with researchers, with communities, working very closely with food producers in order to tweak the existing tools that they have and support them to improve current practice. From a scientific perspective, I'm a scientist. Um, we've been developing new tools and technologies for a long time and there are some fantastic tools that are available to us now. We've got tools that we can scan for unknown chemicals, chemicals that we have never heard of before in the food supply chain. We're able to genome sequence viruses, bacteria, parasites, fungi, anyone that we want and we can tell if they're superbugs, we can tell if they're resistant to heat or chlorine. We need to use those tools and we need to be very vigilant about surveillance of the food supply chain. 
we also need to, in my view, start shifting our mindset about the types we, of food that we eat. So at the moment we're eating a lot of foods that are uh, carbon producers and we need to go to eating foods that are actually carbon mopper-uppers. So, um, you know, keep an open mind, people. You know, if you're presented with seaweed, that could be a good option in terms of where we're heading with the planet. That's sort of the big picture, but look, we've all got a role to play. We can all make a difference and make inroads into climate change. You as a consumer can take really important but simple steps to protect yourself, protect your families, and reduce the impact of climate change. So there's some simple things that you can do. And the first one is wash your fruit and vegetables at home. Cook your chicken thoroughly. If you like mussels, boil them until the shells go pop. So just practice good hygiene at home in your kitchen. This could be the difference between becoming ill and not. Secondly, try and eat foods that are produced locally if you can. Why do I say that? If you eat foods that are coming from the other side of the planet, those are using precious fossil fuels fuels to reach you and they're contributing to the greenhouse effect. Support your local producers and try and eat locally grown food. It will make a difference to climate change. The United Nations have made a list of 10 actions. You can Google it. They're really simple. We can all do these things at home. Use less energy. Turn your lights off when you can. Walk and bike instead of taking a car if you can. Eat more vegetables. That helps. Vegetables utilise, pump out less carbon than other sources of protein such as meats. So try and eat more vegetables. And I've touched on food waste. Throw away less. But the part I didn't say is that all the food you send to landfill rots and produces methane and contributes to climate change. So try and eat everything out of your fridge. Finally, and this is much a message for me as it is for you, we all just have to shift our mentality a bit. Stop waiting for tomorrow. Stop waiting for someone else to do it for you. And just start to take these really little simple steps now. If we do all work together and take these little tiny steps, the future starts to look a little bit brighter and the doors of possibility start to open a little wider. Thank you for listening today.